Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Mario's in Finsbury Park. Mario, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. Hello, mate. Um, yeah, listen, James, I just want to say um, uh, something simple, really, because I've been listening to the programme uh, from this morning. Yes. So, so, And to my concern, I've, I'm from a... Uh, I'm not black. Uh, I'm not from a, a Caribbean country, but my parents came over in the early 60s. And to my concern, personally... When my parents came over, they got documents. They got all their documents and et cetera, et cetera. So what I can't understand is why is everybody having a pop at the Conservative Party at present, which this has been going on for so long? So why didn't they get documentation f so far back? So what I can't understand, even if so, that it's come to light today... Yes. This, this is the, the, the because whole... Because they didn't know they had... I think the answer to your question, if I've understood it, is that they had no idea that they had to. They were British. They were invited to come over here. They brought their children. And it's their home. I, I don't think I could prove that I've been here for the all last right, all right. James, 46 I years. Then, would I be able to say to you then, so you wouldn't have documentation because you're British or you're English? Yeah. I, I didn't think I'd ever need it. Does it make sense? And, and, and furthermore, well, how, what do you mean it doesn't make sense? I, 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 it's, it's it's what I think. I don't, what, what, the idea that I would ever have no, to no, prove. What you say, what, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm disagreeing with what. Obviously, they've come to conclusion of saying, well, they're British. They don't need documents. No, they, they, they haven't come to that conclusion. They are. Well, well. Where did your parents? Concerned. Where did your parents come from? My parents came from Italy. They're right. both Italian. Well, they well, no, th th no one's ever suggested that Italy was part of the Commonwealth, have they? Uh, correct. So your parents but, knew they weren't British. That's right. So they got their paper in. They got their documentation in order. That's right. Well, because they knew they weren't British. Well, yes. These people are British, so they didn't think they'd ever have to prove it. Is right. it clear to you well, now? It is clear to me, but Good. I can say... No, there's no but say... now, mate. You phoned in to ask why didn't they do what my parents did, and the answer is because your parents are Italian and they're British. OK, so we cool? Well, I would say, I would say not, but... Uh, I All would right, well, tell me what you still don't understand, Mario, mate. No, I, still, I still believe that even if they were British, they would still need documentation. Well, I haven't got so... any, and I'm British. Well, how can you not have documents that you haven't got a passport? Where were you in 1978? I was here in England. Where were you living? In Peterborough. Prove it. I can prove it. Go on, prove it now. I can't prove it now because I'm over here. What? I'm, I'm talking to you on the phone. Well, prove it now. Prove it by tea time. And then t prove where you were in 1988. And then I want the postcode of 1998. And I want to see your rent book. And I want to see your mortgage details. And I want absolute evidence that you had the right to be here then and that you haven't been anywhere else in between. Oh, and by the way, your parents were Italian, so they could never have believed that they were British. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. You're just saying really <sighs> yeah, I'm saying. Right, mate. But, but I just think it's the wrong decision. James is calling from Romford. Good evening, James. Good evening, Nigel. Yes, I agree with you, and it pains me to say I agree with Jeremy Corbyn. Blimey. Hmm. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous that people have drunk the BBC's Kool-Aid with this. Everyone... He, uh, Assad was winning. He, he was getting rid of ISIS. He was winning. Why, the, in God's name, would he do this? Why? Well, one argument, James, James, sense. James, I agree with you. The argument that gets put is that by doing this, you know, he spreads fear and terror into the last remaining enclaves, and therefore he wraps up the war more quickly. That's the argument the other side make, James. Oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, look, it's got nothing to do with uh, Iran not using the dollar anymore, is it? <clears throat> or... The fact, look, let's just, let's just uh, cut the proverbial here. General Wesley Clark, a former general in the American Army, come out and basically, I know you know about this, has told everyone, and I suggested earlier to Paul, has looked this up. The Project for the New American Century, it's called, which yep. is a document that they brought out. Uh, they was going to go into seven countries in as many years. And they listed all the countries out, and funny enough, all the countries have been hit, bar Iran, yet. Yeah. And Syria was on that list. Now, they, they also called it the axis of evil, if people remember. 
Oh, yes, that's absolutely. That was yes, a sort yes. of George so, W. Bush and they've phrase, told wasn't you it? They're go into the, they've told you they're going to go into these countries, and now they're doing it. And they're making up excuses, and they're letting off uh, false flags. Or uh, I mean, there's another thing I've been uh, researching about. I'm looking at the photos and what's going on about this apparent gas attack. And you've got army British soldiers who are tweeting on and, and, and messaging, saying if that was what it was supposed to be, the people standing next to them would be dead. Like the, 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 the I don't know. And, and the equipment they're yeah. using to handle these dead people or supposedly injured people, they would be dead. So I don't know uh, about big, that, James. Uh, I don't know about that. Suggest but everyone I, starts really doing some research and stop just watching BBC and reading the Sun. So, James, James, are you, are you, in doubt when the Prime Minister says she's doing this in the national interest? Absolutely in doubt, 110%. We are going to have, let's face it, a war with Russia and China and Iran, OK? This is what it's going to lead to. And so I suggest everybody does everything they can to halt this immediately and stop getting so gun ho because this ain't going to be the Second World War, OK? Well, You're not James, going to be able to go into your garden James, and hide, James, hide I mean, they... Heart. They have, I mean, and, and I will defend the government if for one moment here uh, they've done this in a very limited way. They've been very cautious, uh, but they will do it again. More limited strikes if chemical weapons are seen to be used again. And that's the bit that worries me. Thank you. Mark in Chelsea. Hello. Hi there. Hello. Um, I, I've got, we've got to sort of remember how we got to be here. And it's not about blame. The poor woman's dead. But under Margaret Thatcher's government, it was curious, very odd that socialist-style social housing that's let under the market price for the poor is suddenly sold, so there's less of it. And the obvious thing is to build more of it. But I, being in Chelsea, I'm not exaggerating, see some very curious things, like on one side, the brother of a Marquis who literally dines with the Queen in a house, and next door, people who run on crack in social housing. So. I think that if we do build, which we're going to have to, more of the stuff, there's going to be some serious legislation required so that if they behave in a disgusting way, and the percentage is, you know, uh, uh, crime reporting, that the statistics are out there, uh, people who think it's a right to be given prime, in often cases prime property, uh, they think it's just a right and they can then start to behave in a very disgusting way there, I think they should then be removed for the sake of the rich and poor in society who are surrounding them, you know, who they live next to. It's, it's not, it shouldn't be a sort of right that you can behave in a disgusting way, get somebody pregnant, embark on a career on drugs, and say, well, where's my council flat? It's late, it's a month late. It, it, it doesn't, it, we can't afford to allow it to work like that anymore. Well, I, you're not suggesting that only certain types of people end up on crack, are you, Mark? Well, I, 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 am, I do see that, you know, if there is um, acquisitive crime, often not conducted by major minds, they don't seem to be coming out of <laughs> uh, Belgravia. They often are in, in council estates, which are very close to uh, extreme wealth, like Grenfell. Uh, we're told that there were millionaires opposite it. There's nothing wrong with that, but when you're very poor and often not very bright, and you see wealth surrounding you, uh, perhaps, you know, it's not your fault, but the behaviour of people who are given these properties is not great. Oh, I, I, wish, I wish you hadn't brought Grenfell into this, simply because you're, you're, you're making very sweeping statements about the, 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 the manners and intelligence of poorer people that I'm not very comfortable with, um, and, and also making a huge assumptions about the manners and intelligence of wealthy people that I've seen the opposite of many times. But to say poor suggests perhaps you're working hard and getting paid less. It, that's perhaps a very wrong adjective for me to use. Um, I, I don't know what the polite adjective would be, but it's, it's government funded people who, aren't working and devoted often to career crime and we're housing them in this housing shortage so we should just as we give priority along the lines of health to those who are disabled as opposed to fit we should give priority to those who are decent and how do we decide who's decent 
simple. Look at work records, criminal records. If somebody has been in full-time work for years, as opposed to not, and has no record compared to someone who's never worked and ha has been in and out of prison, as people are released from prison, they're told by their probation officer to apply for council housing. And, and, if, and, if a, and if a very wealthy banker who lives in Chelsea is found to have been part of the LIBOR scandal, does he or she have to get kicked out as well? Uh, I mean, if it's government... That wasn't very decent, was it? Uh, well, often, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think... If, 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 Where do we send them? Their country well, estate? In, in, in terms of bankers, I don't think the government should bail them out when they take risks. I, I think they should be punished in different ways for different things. OK, Mark, thank you for your call. That went off in a direction I wasn't expecting, but thank you. You, you get to decide the direction. Mark and Chelsea. Kate's call from Tufnell Park, Beverley and Hackney. Should the Home Secretary resign over the Windrush scandal, Kate? Yes. T tell me why, specifically. Yes, I think a lot of people should be resigning from that office because I was absolutely astounded when I heard that... Um, that this had been going on for years. I could not believe it. I mean, I'm in my 70s, so I know about before, you know, in the 40s I was born. So I, I just, I still can't get my head around this could be happening to people. I love those people. They are part of our history. They're part of the Commonwealth, our family, which is how we were brought up. That, we were part of this family. And it seems to me that ever since we've joined the EU 40 odd years ago, they seem to want to wipe out our history. And it's wrong. Well, hang on, it's what's it got so to do with the EU? Well, the E. When we this particular the instance, EU, I mean, this particular instance. Yeah. This particular, yeah, the, the, what, 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 yeah, it's not as important, is it? I mean, it obviously this is not important enough. All the people, well, let's get off that. It, all the people in the civil service at the back there that's in the home office, they should be going back to school and learn about our history. Because if I was in that office at my age of 70 and I was a secretary or something and I had all this stuff, these people. I'd have to question it and say, are you sure this is right? You, you, because you'd recognise them as citizens. Yes, I would recognise that this is wrong. I'd have to take it to Amber Rudd if I had to and say, what is going on? And also, these landing cards now that have gone and they still want proof of these people and they've got rid of the proof. And those landing cards, they were those people's history. And if they couldn't file them, why didn't they send them back to those people so they could put them in their history? Quite right. It is astounding. The whole thing is horrid. Do you think horrid, it was? A, do you think it was a precursor to erasing them? Yes, I do. And we should welcome everybody now from the Commonwealth with open arms. I'm furious. I can hear that you're furious, and you're right to be furious, Kate. I mean, I, I can't... I can't anything, well, can I? Well, 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 you can, you can. All of us can give our voice to this and make sure that we back those people from now on, can't we? We can, but this should never have happened. No, it should never it's have happened. It's a beautiful day out there, and this is an ugly episode in our history should never have happened it needn't have happened what i can't shake off i don't know whether i don't know whether you feel the same what, what you've said there about it you know if if you if if the people doing this were more educated and possibly a little older who knows i don't know who they are i don't know what age yeah, they are yeah. but they would have they would have seen who they were dealing with they would have recognized who they were dealing with not not naming them but you know they would have recognized the type of person they're dealing with and what i can't shake off Mm. Is this is the idea that that, that are either that there was either a deaf ear or a blind eye being turned to this somewhere in the mix? Because th there must have been people of an age or, or a, d a degree of knowledge that knew who knew who these people were. I mean, unless it's all this rigid target thing and they don't see anything else, like just ticking boxes. Mm. That's that, well, that's a possibility as well. Get back to being human. Well, I, as well, when Theresa May said in the Commons today, the, the very beginning, she said, here's how it happened. And I thought I was going to get a proper revelation. <clears throat> 
from the Prime Minister of the nuts and bolts of what had gone wrong, and 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 I and we didn't. And and I think if if either of those women isn't going to resign, and it looks as though they're not, um, if if there isn't going to be a resignation over this, I think there does have to be a really transparent explanation of exactly how it came to happen. Saying whoops isn't sufficient, and so far no. we've got whoops and sorry. I don't think they get it still. They just don't get it. Kate, thank you very much for your call. Kevin's call from Bridge End um, on this question of what Jeremy Corbyn uh, perhaps should have done yesterday and, and continue to do about anti-Semitism in his party. Hi, Kevin. Hi, good afternoon. Enjoying the show. I've got no skin in the game at all with this. I brought up by parents who've got no attitudes and I brought up children who've got no attitudes towards this at all. We have completely... You know, we're not anti-Semitic, we're not racist in any way. However, there's a couple of points I'd like to, like to note. 80% of the UK population is non-white. 0.5% of the UK population is Jewish. So both, if you're being anti-Semitic or racist, both are wrong, but they're not wrong in the same order of magnitude. Both are very wrong, but they're not wrong. The uh, Jeremy Corbyn has never done anything physically to cause anti-Semitism. He may not have acted enough to you know to, to get the underlying problem within the, within the Labour Party I don't know but he's definitely not acted towards it what do you mean However, physically when you what, say physically what do you mean well well I, I I don't know you see because I, I because as I say I got no skin in skin in the game I've never even considered an anti-semitic argument I might have numerous friends who are Jews I don't know I've got no attitude towards it at all and I think the vast majority of this, this country have got no attitudes towards Jews at all. Good, bad or indifferent. We, we don't care. We really do not care. We don't like the idea that any minority is being persecuted. But we see situations like this where the PM attacks Corbyn for his lack of action over anti-Semitism. And that is trying to be compared with what she's doing in creating a country that is essentially getting more and more racist and more anti-immigration. And I don't think the two compare in any way. I, I, they're both absolutely wrong. They're both absolutely wrong. But there's no comparison. Well, no I mean, comparison. let me just unpick a little of what you said there, because in let's just take Prime Minister's Questions uh, as an example today. In Prime Minister's Questions, Jeremy Corbyn rightly challenged Theresa May hard on what the heck has been going on in in the Home Office when it comes to the Windrush yes. generation. Mm. But when he described her as callous, I think she had absolute room to say to him, I'm callous. Were you listening in the Commons yesterday when your own MPs were describing the anti-Semitism that exists in your party? I mean, you know, th they, both had, they both had cause to question the other hard. Yes, they did. They had cause, but not at the same scale. Because the problem caused by anti-Semitism compared to the problems caused by immigration and anti-religion attitudes are hugely different in consequence. And I don't, they're both wrong. And, I, I, and I, as I said, at the beginning of this conversation, I've got no skin in the game with this. I've got no... Well, um, well we've all got skin in the game, Kevin, because we're all, well, we all yeah. live here. We're British citizens. Does it, you say, you, I, I'm not that interested in, com, in comparing, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm talking about a very specific form of racism and wondering why in the Labour Party, its current leader won't vehemently, in the middle of a debate in which his own colleagues are describing what's happening to them, in their own party won't speak that's just well, I, odd I isn't it I don't in, yeah, well i don't understand the internals working of the labor party no but well. isn't it odd you understand the words i've just said to you well, i've no, just no, described no, no, the situation it's odd isn't it the other way then why uh, isn't the conservative party criticizing the home office for the way they're treating well uh, yeah well I've, 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 I've just spent an hour yeah, talking yeah, about them yeah. let's talk about this yeah, now yeah, yeah. But, but the, the problem is, as I said, said at the beginning, it's a difference in scale. I agree with the, pr the principle, but I cannot really understand how our PM can use the anti-Semitism angle to criticise Corbyn over, over the effect of what the immigration is. I think the argument is just, it's going wrong. And they're both absolutely wrong. And I have no part in, I, I disagree with anti-Semitism. I disagree with r racism. But I really, when it comes to the argument, we are treating it as if the scale of the problem is equivalent, and I don't think it is. Is it about scale, or is it about, the, or is it about the sheer wretched ugliness of it? 
but but is, is, is it about scale? Most of the arguments, but no. But I, the, 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 the problem the problem with racism is it's absolutely becoming commonplace. I don't think anti-Semitism is commonplace. It is commonplace, to Kevin. But it, it, it might, it might well, be that, in certain that, that you're <laughs> Well, it's commonplace you, because it's commonplace to right. Jewish people, and when they speak up and tell us, we should listen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that is perfectly true. But what I said about the scale of the problem, I would still persist with. Well, you can persist as much as you like, but we have just spent a whole hour talking about the other problem that, that you keep comparing this to. I want to talk about anti-Semitism. I want to talk about what Jeremy Corbyn should be doing that he isn't already doing. And if you think he's doing enough, ring and tell me that. Ring and tell me why this is sufficient. It clearly isn't sufficient for his party colleagues. It certainly doesn't seem sufficient to me. Just that incident yesterday, how you could just sit on your hands when somebody is telling you that in your name these statements are being made, these attacks are being made, how you could not have a response to that in the House of Commons, where you're the leader of the party in question, I simply don't understand. The failure to use his voice yesterday is is what I don't understand. And if you can help me, enlighten me, um, I'd be grateful. Thank you for your call, Kevin. Uh, Alan's call from Faversham on this question. Hello. Hello, uh, Sheila. Um, yeah, I just want to um, talk about this, this, this problem in, in, in aspects of where it came from. Um, I don't think Jeremy Corbyn's handling it, handling it particularly well. Uh, but the anti-Semitic label started because he is anti the Israeli regime and people willingly conflated anti-Israeli with anti-Semitic and he got labelled as an anti-Semite. Then the fact that the media constantly portrays Jeremy Corbyn as an anti-Semite, that has attracted anti-Semites to uh, the party or to follow Jeremy Corbyn. So it's, that has, has created the problem from 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 the, that beginning, um, but, the, but just then, to be, but to be clear, Alan, um, uh, you know the media certainly reports on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, and there was the the Chakrabarti report, which clearly had to be read, examined, and commented on and debated. Um, uh, but it, 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 the media didn't invent this, did they? The party members of the party have concerns about anti-Semitism in their own midst, and they have concerns about the leader's response to that. Would you accept that? They, they, they have yes, they, yes, they have concerns. There is anti-Semitism in the party, and they have con and you've got two halves of the party. You've got the people who have concerns about anti-Semitism in their party, who are the genuine Labour supporters, and then you have the anti-Semitism in the party, which has come from people following what they believe Jeremy Corbyn is, which is an anti-Semite, as he is reported constantly in the media. But why aren't? But why aren't they listening? to him when he says, uh, the two and a half times he has, when he says well, there's no room for anti-Semites in this party. Well, why aren't they listening to him? Why do they still feel so at home in the Labour Party? Because the vast in his majority Labour Party. of the media is right-leaning and the vast majority of the media wants to, wants to, to portray Jeremy Corbyn as an anti-Semite. And he can deny it and they think it's, oh yes, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, yeah, oh no, it's not me. But, but so the media, the like media. the Pied Piper, have lured anti-Semites well, well, into the Labour Party. Is that what you're saying, Alan? Yeah, well, it's not, it's not only them, because it's the likes of John Mann, who will join any bandwagon that is bashing Jeremy Corbyn, uh, he's not Jewish. He, I, I don't know what, what connection he, he has apart from, apart from that this is something that he feels he can pin on, on, on Jeremy Corbyn. What, what? Do you have any criticisms for how Jeremy Corbyn has handled this? Yes, yes, I do have criticisms. I, don't, I think he's, hand, he's, he's handled it badly. But I, there is one suspicion I have, and this might be conspiracy or whatever, I don't know, but um, anti-Semitism directly affects 0.5% of the population. And if Jeremy Corbyn is going to be dragged through the media about something constantly and endlessly, then something that affects 0.5% of the population is not a bad thing to be dragged through the, the, the media about. Let, he may, perhaps he's thinking, let them keep on banging on about anti-Semitism because 90, 
99.5% of the, the population are not affected by that. I'm affected by it and I'm not Jewish, Alan. I'm deeply affected by the idea that anti-Semitism not, and... Well, hang on, hang on. You're, offend, you're offended by it. You're not... You're not I am affected and it. offended. I'll tell you how. You don't have to be Jewish to be affected by anti-Semitism. Clearly, there is a very specific effect if you are Jewish. But the reason all of us are affected, and you should be less relaxed than you are about it, it seems to me, is that when, when it becomes open season on a particular group of people whose history I, I can barely believe I have to remind people of, but we do. When you have to, when, when it becomes open season on those people in particular, and when it becomes something that we are supposedly prepared, uh, supposed to tolerate and, and be relaxed about and not be appalled by, that affects all of us, Alan. Just as, as Luciana Berger said yesterday, when there is an intolerance against Jews, there is an intolerance against difference. And when there is an intolerance against difference, there is an intolerance against humanity. And that affects all all of us. Sheila, uh, it affects everybody, but at, as a ve- unless you are Jewish, it affects you at a very low level. I think there, there are very few well, non-Jewish So you'd people. be the man looking over Auschwitz's wall, would you, and saying, well, I'm on this side, so I'm all right? Oh, that, Sheila, that's just ridiculous. I'm talking about voting. I'm talking about losing votes. Uh, the number of I'm not. I'm talking mean, about decency. Right. Yes, I know, but that's what I'm talking about. That's why I'm saying that perhaps he thinks if, he's, if the right-wing media are gun- going to constantly bash him, then bashing him about something that, that, uh, that directly affects 0.5% of the population. With the other, the other people, when they go to the, to the ballot box, they're thinking about the economy, they're thinking about jobs, they're thinking about education. They're thinking about uh, all kinds of things that directly affect them. And but how does that make you and, judge him? Uh, well, as I say, I don't think he's handling it well. But, but I, more, but is, is that it? The bad tactic? Because it makes me think if that I don't I, mean, I don't know if that's his motivation. But if if that is his motivation for staying quiet or as quiet as he does stay, is if that is his mo here, that's almost as appalling as anti-Semitism. Because it's be, be, I'm, I'm, because I'm it's so that, it's so I'm low. Not, I'm not saying it, that's his mo. What I'm saying is anything he he does. I mean, if, if he well, you did just say to, that, Alan. To, to, well, to start to start with, how many can how many cases can you cite of any political party leader saying this is a problem specifically in my party? It's my party that's wrong. How many? How many? How many instances of, of that can you can you cite in relation to anti-Semitism? In, in relation to anything, in relation to any problem at all, it's not. Well, it's when a not, problem has been proved to exist in a particular party, I think I think they have, haven't they? The, the problem has been created in the party. Mm. Well, look, well, I mean, just look at Theresa May in the House of Commons today on the Windrush situation and, and Amber Rudd yesterday. I mean, they have to do a lot more than apologise, but they've made it clear that there's a problem and they need to fix it. The problem, yes, but they didn't say the problem exists in the Conservative Party. They said the problem ex- exists, exists in, the in the government, which is a Conservative government. government. Yes, but, but that, They're that investigating problem, bullying that allegations started, in their own party after a suicide was linked problem, to bullying in the party. The problem started in the 40s. There's been lots of governments since then. And they weren't all conservative ones. So your assessment... And they they, they actually said, well, actually, this policy came through from the Labour Party, didn't they? So your assessment... She she said that that problem was was instigated by... No, she said specifically the ripping up of the cards was. Yeah, the ripping up of the cards, that's what she said. So so there you go. So she's not saying this is a conservative problem. She's, She's spreading the problem. And, and yet, when Jeremy Corbyn spreads the problem, then, you know, everyone makes a massive issue out of it. In what way has he spread the problem? By, by saying it's in society, rather than saying, yes, it's my Labour But he party. isn't responsible for society, is he? This, 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 is, a, this is a part... No, and, that, and that's, that's the thing. But that's he is responsible saying. for his party. Yes, I know, that's what I'm saying. But how many, how many leaders will say the problem is my party? So you, you think you, so can, can I just can I just clarify something? Do you believe that the anti-Semitism problem in the Labour Party and the problems it is causing Jeremy Corbyn, if indeed it is ultimately, um, yeah. are, are a media confection? I, no, I believe they're real, but they were created by the me- p- people are following the media. Anti-Semitism was created the by the media in this yes. case. Yes. Okay, Alan. Thank you for your call. Let's go to Luke in Orpington. Luke. It's more than that. Uh, perhaps that's the wrong word because it does have connotations, but let's face it, 
he's achieving more than even he expected. He's, uh, I think he's finding himself with more time to do more stuff, which is really great, and it's helping people. I mean, look, he, he did, he, he brought in tax cuts, which is making lots of people lots of money, saving lots of money. He brought in um, the Supreme Court, he sort of that out, didn't he, which obviously brought in lots of yes. different roles, like pro-life and things. Um, he rolled back to the regulations. Uh, what else did he do? The tra- travel ban, which was a temporary thing. I know that caused some, some things, but at least it said, look, borders are ours. Now we'll sort out who comes in, which is fair enough. That's what Brexit is too. Uh, Jerusalem, what a great move. Uh, that was obviously well overdue by a few thousand years. Um, uh, we, we've drawn the, price of the Paris climate deal. Uh, he, did, he, he pulled out that, that silly Trans-Pacific uh, partnership. You are a real Trumpite, aren't you, Luke? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's obvious. You've got to be in denial. Listen, I'm not saying he's the best person to perhaps go for a meal with. Maybe he's... I mean, you've met him yourself. Well, I, I've, 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 Luke, I've been for a meal with him. He's great fun to go for a meal well, with. I mean, he's, you know, he's... I, I meant from a, from a more, you know, more in terms of perhaps um, perhaps he's a bit sort of out there and so on, you know. But not, Obama was a better family man in terms of examples. For example. But look, this isn't a, pers- a personality contest. This is who's a great leader, someone who stands by the convictions, like yourself. And at the end of the day, I think... You know, we, we've got to, we've got to, you, 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 you've been to denial, and of course he's standing up to the, the globalists, which is a huge, massive thing, which a lot of people, you know, are in denial about. And uh, well said yourself, by the way, on um, Infowars, you know, it's, it's exactly right. Well, there we are. Mark, Luke, tell me, what has he got wrong? <laughs> okay, maybe he doesn't show enough respect to the opposite sex. Maybe he doesn't, um, his equality is a little bit, you know, he, look, he's, he's not perfect. He's, he's got lots of uh, issues, no doubt. But at the end of the day, w- when it comes to being a president, you need bullet points, and then you let the people below that deal with the, the finer print things. He's getting Charlie, he's sorting them out, he's sorting North Korea. Um, and, you know, I, to be honest, we do need his support, I would say, with Brexit. I, 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 that would be the next great thing. If he could just stand up to, to, the, to the Europeans, to the globalists who are think they can rule the rules. Finally, you know, the... Uh, oh, do you know, do you know, Luke, I'd love to see him turn up in Brussels uh, with well, Theresa May and give us a hand with Brexit. He put the well, fear of God into them. Luke, I thank you for your call, and Luke, they're a big pro-Trump supporter. Back to the problems, not just in Berlin and Germany, but across the whole of Europe, according to the Israeli president. John is in Romford. John, you're on the radio. Good morning. Hi, hi good morning, Nick. How Hello. Are you, sir? I'm all right, thank you, matey. What are you going to yeah. tell me? Nick, I would like to know, yeah, what evidence you're using that, that these people are Jeremy Corbyn supporters who have sent out these new recent messages to these MPs who was in the House of Parliament the other day. What evidence have you got? In, many, in, in many instances, they use... And I, I did say that I could set up my own Jeremy Corbyn praises. Said, but in many instances... Said, okay, in many instances, they use the hashtag JC4PM. And that, and, uh, yeah, and that and that makes them Jeremy Corbyn supporters. Mm. Don't you think that people don't you think that people would try and be a bit mischievous over this whole over this whole thing? Right? Why would someone who wants Jeremy Corbyn to be prime minister, right, put put, put that at the well, end of their hashtag after well, they've sent a horrible message to somebody? All and, I can you know, say this, is, this, do you not? This, al- what you're doing is you're spreading what you're what you're spreading is fake news. Oh really? And it's complete. oh, really? Yes, it oh. is, Nick. Okay. Yes, it is. You have no proof. You don't think... At all, hold right? on, Jeremy hold on. Corbyn, you don't Jeremy think... Jeremy Corbyn's not a racist, Je- right? I didn't you say... Are, you are I didn't, I didn't are, say he was a racist. Yeah. You are bigoted and racist, right? Okay. Jeremy Corbyn is not. Okay. Right? Do you I, not you think know, it... Do you, Hannah, um, do you not think it speaks to a pattern of behaviour that the people who put up these social media posts about Ruth Smith, about Luciana Berger, about John Mann, either finish with hashtag Corbyn, hashtag anti-Semitism, hashtag JC4PM, and on a closed Facebook group entitled I'm Backing Jeremy Corbyn for Prime Minister, which has 24,000 members, one poster told MPs such as Ms Smith to grow a backbone. You don't think this one, speaks to no, a pattern no, of behaviour? One post out of 24,000 people, yeah? Right, look... OK, I'm so sorry. Let me give you another one. John Mann is a sniffling backstabber. There's two. How many do you want me to do, John? Well, who have they come from? Who, who have they come from? Do you, they, they've you they've come... Oh, here we go again. They've come from a closed Facebook group called I'm Backing Jeremy Corbyn for Prime Minister. So when you talk to me about fake news, John, why don't you actually yeah. do some research? 
and find out what's actually about, happening. Mm -hmm. About what Ruth Smee's done, yeah? Ruth Smee. If you're going to be a foul and offensive about her, I'm going to have to take you off no, air. I'm, but... I'm not going to okay. be foul and offensive about anybody. Go ahead, then. I'm not, I'm not going to be... Right? Okay. Ruth Smee was in a room with, a, with nigh on 200 people, right? And someone someone said something to her in that room. Is this the, is this the Chakravarti and... report you're talking about? Yes, that's, that's correct. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. And she decided at that point that she's going to jump up and run out. Well, she, like she was... She was sing right? Hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. All right, we'll do it this way. She was singled out and highlighted as a result of her faith. You don't... We don't want to live in a country where someone would say, if I was sitting there, look at that fat white Christian over there, would you? Or perhaps that's the world or Britain in which you want to live. Well, she, con considering, that she, considering that she is an MP, yeah, she should have known how to deal with that situation. Given so that it's OK to sure. call her, pardon my language, pardon my language, but it's all right to call her a Zionist, pardon my language, a Zionist bitch, is it? Because she's an MP. Can I finish, can I can I finish what I'm saying? Well, you're in really slippery ground, John, because right. you're, you're verging on a red card. Right. In well, 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 Ruth Smith, right, should have simply turned round to that guy and gave him what for. Because why, should, why should she have to? Why should she? Why, why, she why should she be subjected to something? Because if you want to say, "Oh, there's a Labour Party MP there," fair enough, I'll give you that. Oh, there's a Jew there. No, why should she have to defend herself because she's think, a Jew? Do you think? Yeah. Do you think if someone if someone criticised Diane Abbott for being a black woman, she would have run out of that room? She wouldn't have. She would have given them what for? She would have said to them, "Listen." Why, why, why are you moving us to Diane? Why Why can't you just address this? There's no reason why you should be picked out because you happen to be Jewish or because you happen to be black. No, I agree with you. But let's stick with let's stick with this let's stick with this particular. Hour. Why won't you accept that there is a problem within the party? There's a problem in wider society. No, no, no. I didn't say there wasn't. Why won't no? Okay. Let's we'll come to society in a minute. We'll come to society in a moment. Will you accept there's a problem within the party and people who purport to back Jeremy Corbyn? There is a problem in wider society. There's a problem in this conversation. It's 9.32. You're listening to Breakfast with me, Nick Ferrari, here on LBC. Goodbye, John. Tell this, but Lauren Finchley on the anti-Semitic row. You're on the radio. What are you going to tell me? Good morning. Morning, Nick. Um, I felt moved to call in because you seem to have such an extremist caller earlier on. Um, talking about Islamic anti-Semitism, there mm. is no such thing. I mean... This guy apparently... Well, when, when you see, when you see two... Berlin hang on, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. When you see two Arab males beating two young men in yarmulke yeah. in skull caps, what would that be then? Right. I think perhaps this... It's wrong, let me say that. Yeah. It's wrong, but... When you've got Arabs who are displaced from the Middle East... No, 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 no. Let's just... Let's limit ourselves to Berlin. Let's limit ourselves to Berlin, Laura. When you... Uh, last time... When you see two Arab males beating with a belt two uh, young men wearing skull caps, that's Islamic anti-Semitism, isn't it? No, it isn't because it, you're t we don't talk. All right. So when when what the is it then? In Gaza. When no, no, no. Never mind Gaza. Never mind. Pal we'll come to that conversation. Will you just accept what we saw on the streets of Berlin for what it is? Otherwise, we're going to have to curtail the conversation. Laura. No, but do we call it anti goyism when, when Israelis shoot Palestinians? No, obviously we're not going to get there, are we? Laura, do me a favour, ring someone else, then. Eh? I'm quite happy to have a conversation about what you perceive to be the illegal occupation and many others perceive to be the illegal occupation, the aggressive policies by Israel, the lack of support for the state of Israel. Happy to have those conversations. But when you're asked a direct question on more than one occasion, two or three times you refuse to answer it, that's it. It's another red card. There won't be many players left on the field at this rate, will there? Theresa May. Yes, I think government has lost control of its immigration and asylum policy, frankly. I think we see a degree of chaos in what is happening. And what is perfectly clear from what has taken place and been admitted by the government and by Beverly Hughes in particular at the beginning of this week is that we have in this government ministers who simply don't know what is going on in their department. We have departments that deny the truth and have, it, have to have it dragged out of them. What's, what's the remedy, political remedy? Well, I mean, we've made it uh, absolutely clear, and I, I agree. I mean, I think there are two things. I mean, I do think that Beverly should resign as minister on this particular issue. And I, I find it absolutely extraordinary um, that she has said in front of the select committee uh, and in the House of Commons she blamed officials in her department for this particular decision having been taken. I find it extraordinary that a minister isn't willing just to step up to the plate and take the responsibility. Right. And it seems to me that 
you don't have to take a ministerial job, you don't have to take the car and the extra pay and so forth, but when you do, there is responsibility that has to be taken with it. And I'm actually sick and tired of government ministers in this Labour government who simply blame other people when something goes wrong and are not willing to take responsibility for what is happening under this government and their decisions. John in Edgware, hello. Hi, hi. Yeah, I'm just, I just personally know uh, the, the, the anti-Semitism and the windrush will not have any impact on me whatsoever. Uh, what, what I find is a bit of a problem is that you, you, you're quite right to say that anti, I live in Edge, I live in London Borough Barn, I live in Edge where I've got Jewish neighbours, I've got no, I'm not anti-Semitic in any way, shape or form. But at the end of the day, there is a stain on the Labour, certain parts of the Labour Party and there is a big stain on the, on the, on the Tory party. But there is a significant difference in as much anti-Semitism has been around for 2,000 years. Jeremy Corbyn didn't, didn't create anti-Semitism. No, he didn't. Margaret Thatcher created the Windrush situation. Uh, uh, Theresa May created the Windrush situation. So although you're quite right to turn around and say that there is an issue for both parties, you know, it's a much more significant issue in as much that... If Corbyn, for example, you kept saying about Corbyn talking about uh, talking in the powers of parliament the other day. If he'd have talked that everything that Corbyn says is twisted. Only maybe a few thousand, maybe a million people watch the watch uh, Prime Minister's question time. Or watch these, uh, would have watched that, that debate about anti-Semitism the other day. But millions of people would have read it in the paper. And everything that Corbyn said, has ever said up to now, and I don't even like Corbyn, but everything that he's ever said up to now has been twisted. So they By whom? Taken part in that, by whom? It's twisted by the media. Well, well I mean, I, I, I for one quote him and 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 i i never you know i i just read his words i don't say uh, what i don't say what he said i read I mean, uh, out loud what he said yeah. and and you're wrong john to say uh, just on who sees images from inside parliament i guarantee you that millions of people have seen the speeches given by those mps uh, john mann luciana berger and others ruth smith uh, margaret hodge millions of people will have seen them on uh, television live, they will have seen them subsequently on social media, they will have seen them all over the place. The convenient, they would have seen the convenient cuts to the debate. They wouldn't have seen the debate, and that is where the problem is, and that's where the problem lies with the media. You know, for example, but, but John, but John, John, hang on, hang on. Jeremy Corbyn's uh, part in that debate was so small and didn't involve any words so because he didn't stand up and speak he didn't say anything well okay oh yeah we can argue that he didn't have to i if i was advising him i'd tell him to but 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 i'm just challenging you hang on john hang on john i'm just challenging you on the idea that that these speeches were somehow falsified or the impression they were no they, no a, a, well if you know it, you either replay the whole thing again or listening to our he didn't say anything john how can you cut what he didn't say well exactly no. <laughs> what do you mean exactly stop. you've just talked about the cut being unfair nothing was cut because he no, said now say the cuts were unfair what i said was that a certain section of the of, you don't see the whole debate and that's the problem. That is the problem. People don't sit down and watch those debates. And if they had, they'd have heard the leader of the Labour Party say, say nothing. nothing. And I, if I'd have been Corbyn, and I don't even like the man, I wouldn't have said nothing. Why? Because if he, any word he would have said, listen, everybody's turning around saying that Corbyn's done nothing about anti-Semitism. Not true. Everybody's... I haven't said that. I haven't said that. I'm, well, I'm not talking about you personally. All right, I'm just... Look just around you. Well, you look you're around, talking about the media a lot. You. At the end of the day, the media, the media, I mean... Which one? It's a, so we, huge. We which even, one? Which listen, media? Which had, media? Who are they? We even had a picture of, of Corbyn in a Nazi uniform sitting alongside Adolf Hitler. So don't say... Not here, we didn't. Hasn't had I'm not talking about LBC. We did in this country. It was the other couple yes, of weeks Yes, but I know, but don't just say the media. Be specific. It's lazy. It's lazy and it means nothing. Oh, my. God, why is it lazy? It's lazy why because it lazy? because it's lazy because I'm 76 years old. I've got an I've, I've got an incurable cancer. My memory's not particularly good, and I can't remember which paper that it was in. 
Is that that makes me lazy, does it? It, it makes you lazy if you bl if you blame the media for everything. This lazy person doesn't want to talk to you anymore. All yeah. right, John. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but you can't just say the media changes what Jeremy Corbyn says when we're talking about a specific instance where he said precisely nothing. That is lazy. That is lazy. I'm sorry, John, that the conversation ended that way, but it is. Jonathan's call from Bishop Stalford. Hello. Oh, yes, good afternoon, Sheila. Um, this situation, yes, the wind rush, I think it's uh, been handled very, very badly by the present government. But um, away from that subject, we have an overpopulation in this country, which is why nothing works. I mean, you do endless programmes about why the NHS, local services. It's not about money, Sheila. It's very closely co connected to this situation, not to do with wind rush, but to do with overpopulation. This is, it can't be stressed more that we have too many people living in this country, which is why the services worked years ago and don't work now. We have 25, 30 million more people than we used to have. And also, the other point is that you haven't made in this situation is other countries like Switzerland have always um, very much governed who they bring into the country and, and what denominations. And yet when this country does it, we're criticised as being racist, this, that and the other. We're only doing what other countries do. We're doing the best for our country. We cannot support everyone, which is why we've got the problem with housing. It's not, it's not a housing problem. It's a population problem. So th th this has made you more pro-conservative, has it? Um, not because of Windrush, because I think Windrush is, has been handled totally wrongly by this government, um, particularly by Mrs May, and she's got to take responsibility of that because she was... Um, OK, she, it was brought in, uh, the, we're told that the boarding passes and whatever else, landing passes, were, were under a Labour government and they've got to take responsibility for that as well. But let's be honest, Labour Party have got their own problems and, and uh, Corbyn is signed with all sorts of people around the world that quite frankly he shouldn't be. And, and I don't believe anybody should vote for him at all if they need to change the leader, if Labour have got any chance of, of winning any election. And I think he's, some people in his own party think that. And, and, yeah. and, and on the Conservatives, on immigration in particular, you, you see them as a, a party of strength, do you? Windrush well, aside. Let's, let's be honest. Without being racism and bringing any sort of colour or creed into it, Sheila, people in this country, a majority, a majority for all those Remainers out there, which you keep banging on about and, and just bad losers, we could have lost the other way and we would have just had to deal with it, suck it up and move on. But... The end of the day, and, and would you have? Have, sorry? would you have? Sorry? Would you have? I don't think I would have had a choice, Sheila, because you know what? If this was a general election, would all these people like Tony Blair and all the others moaning and moaning and moaning, would they all be then saying, oh, well, we didn't win the election? You know, this is the first election ever that I can ever remember in my lifetime where it's been, been challenged. Whereas we, we didn't want Blair in, I didn't want Blair in, but did I go and then start doing placards in the street saying I wanted, wanted him out, I wanted a rerun of the election. No. It's just bad losing. Well, well, that's because you knew there was going to be one in four years' time. Sorry? That's because you knew there was going to be one in four years' time. And that's the, the, the difference with Brexit well, is it's yeah, all rather final, the, isn't it? The, the basic thing I'd like to leave you with is the fact that it's not about racism. It's about dealing with the country and making it work. At the moment, it does not work. And it's not about money for the NHS. You can put £70 billion pounds into the NHS, it won't be enough because it's serving too many people. We've got a housing issue which is caused by too many people. We don't need... All well, it's people. caused by too few houses. That's another way of looking at it, Jonathan. Thank you for your call, Jonathan and Bishop Stortford. I'm going to go to Halifax and speak to Andrew. Good evening, Andrew. Good evening, Nigel. So, am I right, am I right to think that they're not following the will of the people... You're absolutely right with a cherry on top, and I say that as both a Conservative voter and a Brexiteer. Right. Uh, um, I, I actually regard immigration as like adding sugar to a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. If you add one or two spoonfuls, it improves the flavour. In other words, if you have modest immigration, it benefits a country. Uh -huh. However, if you go for what successive governments have done for the last 20 years, which is not really about immigration as economic necessity, but a deliberate policy of population replacement, what you end up with then is cups full of sugar and no coffee or tea whatsoever. And I'm afraid, uh, you know, your last call, London is a classic example of that. Well, you know, he was... I, I mean, I wasn't going to get sidetracked into a debate about London, but I think there are parts of East London that we could visit, uh, you know, where we'd say, actually... 
uh, what very large-scale immigration had done is to change those areas into something completely different in every way to what they were before. But I'm not going to I'm not going to get down that debate, that cultural debate today. You know, Andrew, I I think I genuinely think that Gove and Johnson and the whole blooming cabinet are so politically correct, they're the most PC people we've ever seen before. They don't even sound like Conservatives, Andrew, on any of these issues. Well, I, again, I, I agree with you. And, uh, you know, as a, a Brexit voter, I see a little bit of a, a betrayal every day from the, you know, the sort of the Machiavellian machinations of the vermin in ermine yesterday in the Lord. Yes. Uh, right right up to, you know, these, these proclamations from Gove and, uh, and yeah. uh, Johnson. I mean, well, Tory yeah. voter, Andrew. Tory voter, LBC platform. What's your message to Gove and Johnson? Uh, get a grip and stop concentrating on what life is like uh, within the M25 in this metropolitan bubble. Get out into the rest of the country. You know, there are millions of us out there that are of equal importance, the London Opinion, and get out there and discuss to some of us what we think about this wholesale change to our communities because we are not happy with what's gone on. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Very precise, very succinct. Helen is a new caller to the show. She lives in Exeter. Good evening, Helen. Hello, Nigel. Nice to hear from you. Well, 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 actually, I'm hearing from you, really. But um, so, you know, I am I am making a charge against Johnson and Gove. They're too politically cracked. They're scared to deal with the issue, and they're letting Brexit voters down like a cheap pair of braces. Am I right? Am I wrong? Yes, I have. I already suspect we've been um, sold down the river with the fish. Mm-hmm. And I think now they've done it with immigration, or they're going to do it with immigration. So I have every intention of selling them down the river when it comes to the election. I shall stand back, hold my nose, and not vote for anyone, thereby advising all my friends and family to do the same, opening the door for Jeremy Corbyn. If they want a liberal, in big inverted commas, mm -hmm. Britain. Liberal Brexit, them. it's everywhere. Yep, yep, yep. That's what they say. Let them have it. They can sit and watch their money drift in Jeremy Corbyn's pocket. And, Helen, would you, in general elections, would you normally be a Conservative voter? Oh, yes. Right, OK. So you do feel pretty strongly about this. Wow. You feel I, could, I couldn't if if they don't do what they promise. Yeah. I couldn't never ever vote for them again. Right, Helen. And, you I, that that is an incredibly strong message. Um, they better do what we told them to jolly well do, or people like Helen from Exeter won't support them. She couldn't have been clearer, really, could she? Peter's in Berry. Peter, what would you like to say? Oh, good morning. Uh, this is going to this is going to take a lot of courage from both nations of Ireland. What I'm going to say, but I'm going to first of all, I want to take you back to when they had the referendum, the Republic of Ireland, and then they had to have another one. No, they didn't. Uh, you the, we need to correct yeah, this idea. They, they had they didn't have two <laughs> referendums on the same issue, did they? Because they they changed the treaty. Well, they changed it, yes. But in in the respect of it, it, it kind of like was like the same in a way. No, no, no it, but it kind of like wasn't no. remotely. That's the whole point: is that the European Union took the result of that referendum, took on board the concerns of people who'd voted against it, against signing that treaty, changed the treaty, went back to the people of Ireland, asked them again, and they said, "Thank you for taking our reservations and concerns into account. You have successfully changed my mind." Because you know that great quote of John Maynard Keynes, Peter. You, what you tell me? When the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? So we can leave that canard in the fridge and carry on with your solution to the Irish border question. Right, OK. Well, we, it's true. We all change our minds through the years. We all get a bit mature. And uh, what I'd like to say is we need to start and it's got to go for the generations to come this and i think those generations to come really no it's got it's got to be it's got to be done by the end of the transition period mate yeah, not generations right. to come just, and and really it needs to be in place by june so that we can negotiate it at the next meeting okay here it is then here it is 
both, both, both nations of Ireland take on dual nationality of the UK. They have a referendum to come out of the EU. That's for the, Repub that's for the Republic of Ireland. They don't want to. Come out of the EU. They, come don't, out of the they EU. don't want to. It's the people. This, this isn't the people. This is the politicians that are making these ideas. These are the politicians that are making it because there's money for them to be made. So, so how does that work? There's money, there's money for politicians to be made. It, it, how, how do they make money? Politicians do make money. Because they make money uh, on... on, on, on Various, various things. Well, just give me... A, well, tell me an example of what you're talking about, cos I'm a bit lost, my friend. Right, I'm going to give it you plain, just plain and simple about this, OK? Well, it's you certainly mention, simple, you know, but I'm not sure it's plain. Right, I'll do the best I can, cos I've thought about this for years. It's, it, the island needs to come together. We all need that. We all, to move forward, we have to come together. We ought to stop the squabbling. That is years and years. Also, they they did stop the it. That was called the Good Friday Agreement. And it's still going on. No, no, it's not. It's enjoyed its longest it's period of it's peace in James, living it's for 500 it's years, arguably. James, yes, it's Peter? It's in the mindset of people. What is? When were you last there? You only need when to were you last there? You know, I was there. I was in Ireland about uh, ooh, 15, 20 years ago. And, and the mindset of the people today is something that you feel you have a degree of expertise on. No, James. If you just let, just don't don't butt in for a minute and just let's look. I can't at let you, you talk at, nonsense, Peter. It's embarrassing for both of us and an insult to my listeners. Look at the look at the uh, look at the situation of it. Football, Celtic Rangers. They're still the Irish. They're problem. Scottish. They're still the segregation. Yeah, but they take on the Irish situation. They're it's Scottish. Still there. And it, it is. It's still there. What is? <sighs> I'm wasting my time with you. You certainly are, mate. So, what's going to happen at the border? What's going to the border? I think at the moment they're, they're just going around in circles. I don't think anything's going to happen. You think they're going around in circles? So what's going to happen at the border? What, what's the solution to, to having identical trading conditions on both sides of a border while only one side is in the single market and the customs union? How's that, how's that going to work, Peter? I, I, I heard some of the earlier say we can go off number plate recognition. Yes, they were talking twaddle, mate. Absolute twaddle. So how's it going to work? The only, the only, the only other solution is, if that's the case, that you go off microchip pro properly, so you microchip the population, so you know who's, who's in there. Wow, well, there we go. So here's, a, you're gonna, you're gonna. What if, they, what if they don't want to be microchipped? Is it going to be compulsory? Well, that's it. So that's your answer it. is now, now that we've really gained to the crux of it, and your insight into the mindset of the people of two countries, one of which you visited 20 years ago, we need to compulsorily microchip all of them. No, well, and this, these are the problems. These are the things that you hear that could happen. People get. So, what's your solution? You phoned in to tell me your solution. What's your solution? The solution is to give a referendum to the whole of Ireland. Do you want to come together as one nation? And then also throw in the throw in the question: Would you like to be dual nationality for the UK and Irish? And then you've got a good commerce. The, 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 the pound is very strong. I think the pound is even stronger than the euro. What are you talking about, Peter? Give the chance to the, for the Irish people but to the, vote... The, the Irish want people don't want a referendum on, on what you describe. The Irish people are perfectly happy where they are. What are you talking Irish, about? You think that the Irish British government change. should force the Irish government to have a referendum on something they don't want to have a referendum no. on? And the alternative is to put microchips in them all because you went there 20 years ago and you got an insight into their mindset built upon your knowledge of football in Glasgow. On a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you think this gone for you, Peter? Uh, I'd say about 7. Would you really? And your vote, my friend, is worth the same as mine. What an absolute travesty. Bob's in Romford. Bob, what's going on? Um, yeah, I'd like to um, try and come at this at a slightly different angle. Well, that would be wise, my friend. Very, very wise. Um, the EU obviously wants access to the money that we've agreed to pay them. As an out-of-court settlement, the 35 to... No, that's, that, that, is, that is the observance of our financial commitments that were already established under the terms of our trading treaty. So if we don't pay it, we might as well put a big sign up at Dover saying, don't believe a word we say, we'll break trust, we'll break contracts as easily as Boris Johnson cheats on his wives. Actually, what it, what it is at the moment is it's an, an offered... An offer it's been agreed, Bob. Yeah, no, it's in a draft agreement. It's been agreed. 
It's an they abuse. couldn't it's press on with the trade negotiations until they'd agreed the divorce settlement. Do you yeah, no, people watch the news? We have to agree that it's a draft agreement at the moment because it hasn't been completed. Oh, crikey. And you remember the EU's dictum that nothing is agreed till everything's agreed? Yes, and we don't move on to the second stage of negotiations until the three stages have been agreed in the first. Ireland, the fate of EU citizens and the divorce settlement. They've kicked Ireland into the long grass. The fate of the EU citizens has kind of been fudged. The only thing they've agreed on is the so-called divorce settlement. But you right. carry on with your genius analysis. Well, OK, thank you for that. I appreciate the sarcasm. And have you seen the news today about that divorce bill, have you? From the National Audit Office? I haven't seen the, the news today It's yet. gone up. Yeah, OK. By, by about £10 billion. Pounds. Right, so there could be more at stake. But the point I'm going to make is if you push the... If the EU pushes the UK government into a corner on the Irish border... What question, corner? How is it a corner? Because we take, we keep bringing them solutions in a game of bring me what's, a rock. What's the solution that works, Bob? No, I'm, I'm not going to get into the detailed solution. Ah! Into, then why have you phoned me? Because it's about the negotiation. It's about the, the solution. What solution works, Bob? The whole programme is dedicated to the self-evident truth that you cannot solve this problem while observing the tenets of the Good Friday Agreement and the rules of customs union membership. But you told me there is a solution. What is it? No, the, the, that's, I'm not talking about the solution. Well, that's I am, and it's my show, so what is the solution? Found. The solution will be found if there's good faith negotiation on both sides. At the moment, that's not what we've got. So you have absolutely no idea what it's going to look like, smell like or talk like, but you're supremely confident that it's going to turn up one day. I am confident, but fortunately I'm not involved in the negotiations. But you couldn't do any worse, Bob. Are we, I mean, we could talk for hours. Are you going to offer up a scintilla of, of explanation as to what this thing on the horizon actually looks like? Or are you just going to keep saying, no, something will come up, it, it has to be good, someone clever will come along and solve it. I'm We've only been doing it for 22 you. months. I'm trying to tell you how it will eventually be settled. Go on, then. It will be settled because, at the moment, the UK government cannot possibly agree to a border down the Irish Sea. No government could do that, regardless of whether they were propped up by the DUP or whether they had a 150-seat majority. Why not? No UK government would ever agree to cutting off... Why not? ...Northern Ireland. They won't. It's, it's, I mean, they're constitutionally part of the UK. They're never going to do Why not? That. They keep saying, why not? That's ridiculous. But the last caller was telling me it was inevitable. So I, I'm respecting his... Yes. But I'm, I'm, I'm brand of nonsense. I'm dealing in the real world here. You're not dealing in the real world, Bob. You just said, I've got no idea what it is or how it could work. All of the we're experts say that it off. can't, but Bob knows we're better. We're not going to cut off Northern Ireland, are we? are not going to cut them off. That's an unreasonable position. Well, the, the last polling on it said that most Brexit voters would be happy to cut off Northern Ireland. Well, I, don't, I don't believe that's true. It might be true in an opinion poll. The point is, if you push the UK government into a corner, they will be forced to collapse the whole draft agreement. <laughs> this is, the Bob, mate, listen, come no, come here a minute, mate. Sit down, all right? No, the money will go away. That's take, the whole take, take a seat. The government is not being boxed into a corner by the European Union. The entire point of this conversation and this ongoing disaster is that there is no solution. Everybody understands this, except with the greatest of love and respect, people like you who insist there is a solution but have not got a Scooby-Doo what it might look like. I'm not responsible for finding it. The government is. Well, good luck with that, Bob. It's 10.45. I know he's a moron.